Father God, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, for another chance. It wasn't a second chance, it wasn't a third chance, but it was another chance. And I pray now, God, that you would bless the person whose hand I hold and show yourself strong on behalf of my brother, my sister. God, I pray that you will continue to bless us as we seek to get close to you. And God, I pray that you would help us to be sensitive to your voice today as you speak to us through your word. Save and heal, strengthen, even deliver. And I pray, God, that you get all the glory because you're in a class by yourself. Let fresh anointing, God, remain upon our lives. And then, God, I ask as always that you'll let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Why don't you put your hands together. Let's give the Lord a strong hand clap for praise. <coughs> I just allow those in the concourse to join us quickly in the sanctuary. On last Sunday, uh, we preached a message entitled, It's the Second Half. It came from Exodus. In the Old Testament records, the book of Exodus chapter 34, and we talked about it's the second half, and thank God that he'll give you a second half, another chance, and um, we underscored the fact that in the first half that we uh, have made great strides for the Lord, but while we have made great strides for the Lord, we have not necessarily given God the best that we could have given him in terms of our commitment and consecration of ministry. And uh, one of the things that we must continue to do a better job at is discipleship development, uh, which has always been an emphasis at the Canaan Church. We seek to be a simple church with the kingdom focus. And throughout this year, continuously, we want to now highlight, even in a greater way, our commitment to helping every person to becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so with that in mind, I want you to look today in the New Testament records and the gospel as recorded by St. Matthew chapter 3, and we want to read verses 1 through 6. And the gospel as recorded by St. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And if you will stand for the reading of the Word of God, if the person beside you doesn't have a Bible, if you'd be so kind as to share your Bible with them. And while the um, media team puts the scripture on the screen, that is not for your convenience. That's just for those who may be sharing with us through Canaan Stream in Faith and for first time visitors who may be coming to church who have never had a relationship with God. But if you're a Christian, you ought to bring your Bible with you to church. Don't come to church naked. It is not presentable. Amen. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 3, beginning with verse 1, reads like this. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then... Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> if you be so kind as to take the hand of the person beside you, look them right in the face and tell them, can God use a person like me? Look at someone else and tell them, that's what I really need to know. 
can God use a person like me? The vast majority of us <clears throat> who are gathered today in the sanctuary would refer to ourselves as Christians. And perhaps the question that we need to ask ourselves is what does this mean to us personally and how is this betrayed before others? Many of us who have been in church for a long time and who are students of the word know that the title Christian means to be Christ-like. When we say we are a Christian, we are implying that we have come to know God in a personal way in Jesus Christ. And we're also saying that our lives have been so transformed that we are now representatives of Christ in the world. That God has chosen me as his ambassador to lead others in a saving relationship with him. And the question that I often raise to myself is, can God use a person like me? The tendency is for us to think that the only people who can be used to do something special and significant are people who are unusually gifted and people whose background has not been tainted too badly. However, when we consider the person in our text today, we recognize that God can and will use anyone who makes themselves available to him. No matter who they are, where they came from, or what makes up the context and content of their lives. For the spotlight in our text is on John the Baptist. And we are told, now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. In our day and time, we would say that John the Baptist was eccentric, putting it nicely. We would really say he was strange. And yet crowds of people came out into the wilderness to hear him preach. And not only did they hear him, but they received his message and were baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan, confessing their sins. John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. God was willing to use John the Baptist because he saw in him a person who would embrace his mission embody his name, and obey his word. God was willing to use John the Baptist because he saw in him a person who would embrace his mission, embody his name, and obey his word. God was willing to use John the Baptist because he saw in him a person who would embrace his mission, embody his name, and obey his word. And in like manner, God will use any person today. He will use you and I if we will fully give ourselves to him and make ourselves available for his will to be worked out in our lives. And it is interesting that the message that John came proclaiming is the same message that Jesus came proclaiming. For in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17, we are told from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is the idea of the kingdom that became the centerpiece of the revelation that God was manifesting in the world. John came talking about the kingdom. And throughout his ministry, Jesus just kept on talking about the kingdom. When Jesus began his ministry, he gave what is commonly known as the Sermon on the Mount. And in this teaching, Jesus explained what the kingdom was about and what the expectations would be for those who would be citizens in the kingdom. In Matthew chapter 13, there are several parables that Jesus gave 
And every parable is an explanation about the kingdom. Even after his resurrection, we are told in the book of Acts, he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Jesus just kept on talking about the kingdom. What is the kingdom? The kingdom has to do with the rule and reign of God. The kingdom has to do with the rule and reign of God. There is a paradox about the kingdom. On one hand, the kingdom is present, and on the other hand, it is a hope to come. On one hand, the kingdom has existential value because it is a present reality. The kingdom is a present reality because whenever a person accepts Jesus Christ, as their personal Lord and Savior, God begins to have the rule and reign in their life. The kingdom is present in the life of every believer. I'm Dr. Walter Malone, Jr., pastor and founder of the Canaan Christian Church, and we're so honored and happy to have you to share and be a part of this worship experience today. We are praying God's choice and blessings on your life. I'm doing a particular type of series right now with the focus on discipleship development and the focus or the theme of today's message is can God use a person like me and I'm going to be dealing with the text from Matthew's Gospel chapter 3 verses 1 through 6 with a uh, focus on this biblical character of John the Baptist and I'm sure that this word is going to be both insightful and inspirational for you. We're going to break away for just a minute so that you can hear about some of the upcoming events that's going to take place on the Canaan campus as well as how you can secure CDs and DVDs of previous worship experiences that will be a blessing to your life. Thank you again for being a part of this worship experience and I am just praying God's choice blessings on your life. I'm going to break away now but I'll come back and share with you at the end of this worship experience and we're so honored to have you to be a part of this service. We are adding a new worship service. Along with our 11 a.m. service, we will now offer an 8 a.m. service. Different times, same worship experience. So set your alarm and invite your family, friends, and neighbors to come and participate in the great worship of the Canaan Christian Church. The kingdom is present in the life of every believer. Because to be saved means that one has accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. If he is your Lord and your Savior, that means God right now has the rule and the reign in your life. And if God has the rule and the reign in your life, then the kingdom of God is present right now. Somebody just shout right now. On the other hand, the kingdom has eschatological significance. The kingdom is a hope to come because one day Jesus Christ will return and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord to the glory of God. I know that we live in a world where there are atheists, people who say, there is no God. And I know that we live in a world where there are agnostics, that is people who say, I believe that there is a God, but I can take him or leave him. But I want you to know a day's coming, every knee is going to bow, and every tongue is going to confess that he is Lord to the glory of God. Herein lies the problem with the church today. Many people who attend church have no clue as to what the kingdom of God is about. And the reason being is because we do not know the word of God. And we don't know the word of God because we do not hunger and thirst after righteousness. For many of us, church is the building we go to. Church is just a weekend affair. 
we fail to understand that as Christians, we are the church. When we say church, it should mean kingdom. And when we say kingdom, it should mean church. When we say church, it should mean kingdom. And when we say kingdom, it should mean church. When we say church, it should mean kingdom. And when we say kingdom, it should mean church. When we say church, it should mean kingdom. And when we say kingdom, it should mean church. When we say church, it should mean kingdom. And when we say kingdom, it should mean church. When we say church, it should mean kingdom. And when we say kingdom, it should mean church. When we say church, it should mean kingdom. And when we say kingdom, it should mean church. Just tap somebody and say, I think I got it now. Jesus said, listen, listen, on this rock, this is what Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Listen, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And many who would say they are clear about the kingdom have no allegiance or commitment to the advancement of God's kingdom in the world. The Bible says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. We say we are Christians, but we fail to honor God with the tithe and offering. We say we are Christians, but we never seek to witness to the lost. We say we are Christians, but we are unwilling to come together and pray for the kingdom. We say we are Christians, but we refuse to serve in an area of ministry. We say we are Christians, but we fail to love one another and will even go so far as to cause disruption and discord in the body of Christ. Look at the person beside you and tell them, who do you think you're fooling? And if you think it's okay to come to church every now and then and carry the name Christian like a tag, you are sadly mistaken. And one day you may be in for a rude awakening. Historically, we can think of the kingdom as occurring in four unbroken time periods. You may even want to write this down. Historically, don't miss this. Don't miss this. If you don't write it down on paper, write it in your mind. Historically, we can think of the kingdom as occurring in four unbroken time periods. That means connected. History is going somewhere. The first period could be described as the Old Testament and Israel. The children of Israel were the chosen people of God. They were the descendants of the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You remember God called Abraham and said, I will make your name great. You should become the father of a great nation and through your seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. And the children of Israel were in bondage in Egypt, the, the, the descendants of the patriarchs, and God sends Moses down to Egypt and delivers Israel out of captivity in the land of Goshen, brings them to a place called Mount Sinai. Listen carefully to what God said to Israel. He says, if you will be my people, then I will be your God. Listen carefully. And you shall be a kingdom of priests, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And Isaiah said that Israel was to be a light unto the nations. Other nations, other people were to come to know who Yahweh was, who the true and living God was through the nation of Israel. It was the manifestation of God establishing a kingdom. And then, secondly, historically, we see the establishment of the kingdom in the life of Jesus. He was the long-awaited promise of a coming king. 
when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Bethlehem of Judea, and the wise men came looking for him, they said, where is he who is born king of the Jews? Jesus was the very embodiment of the kingdom. He came to establish the kingdom. Progressive revelation. And everything he preached and taught was about the kingdom. And if that's what he preached and taught, that's what you and I ought to be preaching and teaching. And Jesus said that he came to establish the kingdom and you and I are citizens of the kingdom. When you read the Sermon on the Mount, you're reading the ethical mores and teachings of what it means to be a citizen in the kingdom of God. And while we are living in this world, we have dual citizenship. We have a citizenship in time and a citizenship in eternity. We have a citizenship in the world and a citizenship in heaven. And that's why the child of God does not get comfortable down here. We say this world is not my home. I'm just a pilgrim traveling trying to make heaven my home. And then historically there is the church. God's primary instrument for kingdom advancement in the world. Unbroken time periods connected to each other. Pass Malone, what is the time period in which we live in today? This is the time of the church. This is the time of the church. We're living historically in the period of the church. The church is not something you and I started. The church is that which God gave birth to. And it was the church that Jesus Christ said, go into all the world and make disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'll be with you always, even until the end of the world. God gave his Son to save the world, and then God called the church to reach the world on his behalf. He does not have a contingency plan. There is no plan B. If the church doesn't reach the world on behalf of Christ, it does not happen. It was left to you and I. This is the age of the church. So that the church today now becomes the new Israel. That's why when you read Paul's letters in the New Testament, Paul says that Israel today is not those who would claim lineage historically to Abraham. But, but Israel today are those who are the seeds of Abraham who have put their faith and trust in Christ. It's the age of the church. We are living, my dears, in the dispensation of grace. We are living in the time where God is pouring out his spirit. That's why this is the year of manifestation. And that's why every blood bought, every child of God can anticipate that God will do something prolific and something profound in your life because he chooses to do it because God wants to manifest his kingdom through your life. And the only person who misses it is the person who is not spiritually in sync with God and does not have a clue as to what God is doing in the world. Now the final period, the final period in history is Christ's return. The triumphant king. And Revelation says he will reign forever and ever. That's the last period. The last period. See, some people get too caught up on the latest thing. But you really ought to have your mind on the last thing. Come on, somebody say the last thing. Yeah, the last thing. The coming of the king. Jesus 
has already been here once. He was born in a manger in Bethlehem. He walked the dusty streets of Palestine. Open up a uh, blinded eyes, unstopped death ears, caused the lame to walk, raised the dead from the grave, went out on a hill called Calvary, took a cross up the Via del Rosa, crucified on a cross, buried in another man's tomb. He, he got up Sunday morning with all power in his hand. He ascended back to glory from Mount Olivet. He's got a name now that's above every name. And one day he shall return. Is there anybody looking for anticipating the second coming of the Christ? Now, I'm a Christian unapologetically. I'm a Christian. And I thank God for my Jewish brothers. And my Jewish brother and I, we can walk together in the Bible. My Jewish brother and I, we can walk together in Scripture from Genesis to Malachi. We can start in Genesis and we will walk together, my Jewish brother and I, from Genesis to Malachi. The only problem is he stops at Malachi and I keep on walking. I walk on to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because I'm not waiting on the Messiah to come the first time because I'm declaring he's already been here. Now I am waiting for him to come I am waiting for him to come, but it ain't a first visitation. He's coming a second time. Not as Messiah, but as the triumphant king. How we bless God for this word, for this revelation that God has given us today, that the question is raised, can God use a person like me? The same God who used John the Baptist will use you and I if we will just submit our lives to him and allow God to work in us and through us to his good pleasure and according to his will. I pray that you were tremendously blessed by this word as my life was. And I want to invite you to come and share with us at the Canaan Church at the Canaan Campus. We are located at 2840 Hikes Lane. Come be a part of a church that dares to dream. We are passionate, we are connected, and we are committed. I look forward to seeing you soon in worship at the Canaan Church. If you wish to purchase a copy of today's message, call 502-459-5578, extension 131. Leave your name, number, and a title of today's message.